From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lyons. A head-spinning afternoon in crypto as the SEC says it has not yet granted approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs, despite a post on X from that regulator's official account that suggested otherwise. Chair Gary Gensler says the account was compromised. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has prostate cancer. That is the cause of his mystery treatment at Walter Reed. We'll run through the political ramifications with our political panel. And former President Trump's team makes its case to an appellate court for why he should be immune from criminal federal prosecution. We'll talk with law professor Jessica Roth. And we are now learning allies of Ukraine met last month to discuss Kiev's conditions to hold talks with Russia. How would Vladimir Putin respond? Angela Stent, author of Putin's World, will be with us this hour. Quite an interesting afternoon, as it turns out, Kaylee. I've been watching you on Bloomberg TV go through some gyrations here on what we thought was a major breaking story. I suppose it is, just not the one we thought initially. We have been expecting that by tomorrow the SEC may approve a spot Bitcoin ETF, yeah. something that has never been done in the U.S. before. Mm-hmm. So when a post on their official account suggested that had happened, everybody was kind of anticipating that it was. <laughs> Only sure. four minutes later to Chair Gary Gensler to say that the account was compromised. And in fact, those approvals have not yet happened. It raises so many questions, Joe, but I would just point out that Gary Gensler always, when discussing crypto markets, has pointed out that he views them as rife with fraud and easily manipulated. And the kind of activity we saw in Bitcoin on these headlines Mm -hmm. may speak to that kind of manipulation. Yeah, it's been an interesting uh, afternoon, and that doesn't uh, preclude any potential news tomorrow. As you mentioned, right. Kaylee, we are still expecting this to happen. It's just the way that it, it went down today. I uh, want to talk to Ben Bain about this. Joining us now around the table, Bloomberg's Ben Bain, Wendy Benjaminson, along with Dan Flatley, because we have a lot to talk about, Ben. We're going to start with you here in this case. Do we have any idea what happened yet, where this came from? Because it did look like uh, a tweet that would be officially from the SEC. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so it very much did. It, it was on the SEC's uh, page, as, as, as Kaylee mentioned. What, what actually uh, became clear very quickly is that, indeed, there was uh, you know, a, a compromise to this account. Um, there's been this speculation mounting for weeks that the SEC is coming up against this January 10th deadline to approve or disapprove one of these spot Bitcoin ETFs. Mm-hmm. And everyone has been kind of getting on this. This is the, this is the big moment when perhaps... Crypto and Bitcoin in particular will take a step towards the mainstream. Uh, so kind of everyone's on, on razor's edge, if you will. The markets are certainly paying close attention. Not that Bitcoin doesn't gyrate on its own, but yeah. in particular, um, at this moment, it was very much looking for anything. And then this came through, and uh, we saw a brief pop in Bitcoin, and then quickly yeah, uh, came back down to where it was. Now, where we are right now is we're still expecting uh, some type of determination Um, This week, uh, we've reported that there's uh, going to be some type of commission vote, Mm -hmm. at least on one of the key filings. Uh, And there's also a series of other filings that are coming through. Certainly still a lot of optimism this is going to happen in the industry. But yes, nothing has been approved, the SEC says. Chair Gary Gensler made very clear that this was a compromise of the SEC's official uh, X account. And that's where we are. Well, Ben, can you just, for all of us who just experienced this, went through this within the last hour, how should we expect to receive this information from the SEC when this decision finally comes? Is it likely to be an ex poster? Will we actually get some more official communication? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know, but I would, uh, I would probably bet it's not going to be an ex post just based on, uh, you know, what we, what we saw uh, happen today. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I guess that, that remains to be seen. What we do know and what we reported is that there is expected to be some type of commission vote, some, some kind of official uh, type of process, which, which hasn't yet occurred, right. uh, and- despite what... Uh, briefly was set on X. <laughs> and we will be double verifying all of this information, Ben Bain. Thank you uh, so much. We'll look forward to you and your team's coverage over the last uh, next 24 hours. We want to turn now to a separate issue with Bloomberg's Wendy Benjaminson, which was another matter of breaking news, Wendy, we were dealing with earlier in the day, the revelation that the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, has prostate cancer, that he received a procedure back in December, and that is 
Complications from that brought him back to the hospital where he has been for days now. Something else we learned, though, is that Biden basically learned that information along with us. Here is National Security Council spokesman John Kirby earlier today. He was not informed until last Friday that Secretary Austin was in the hospital. He was not informed until this morning that the root cause of that hospitalization was prostate cancer. Nobody at the White House knew that Secretary Austin had prostate cancer until this morning, and the president was informed immediately after we were. Wendy, how? <laughs> Very good question, Kaylee. I mean, in a normal workplace, if you got a health diagnosis like that that would require a lot of treatment, time away from the office, you would probably pull your boss aside and tell him, this is the United States Defense Secretary, who not only runs the most powerful military on the planet, but he also is in the line of succession to the presidency. We're in the middle of a tense situation in the Red Sea, in the Middle East, um, in China and other places around the world. And he was uh, not reachable. So, you know, on top of what Ben was just describing with the SEC through no fault of its own, a week before voters start voting in the, in the mm. presidential election, you have this appearance of a gang that can't shoot straight, you know, of a White House that isn't running things the way it should be. You know, they have sort of laid this on Austin himself, saying he should have told us there's going to be a review, but we are fully committed to him. And, of course, you know, they also, as we do, have, you know, wishes for his speedy recovery. But the idea that he thought he could have surgery under general anesthesia in December, then, you know, have to go back for this procedure and never occurring to him to tell even the national security advisor, let alone the president, it really is kind of baffling. So what needs to happen here? Obviously, Joe Biden is not going to fire the defense no, uh, secretary in an election year here. There are other reasons why that might be a pretty bad idea politically. Uh, but there's going to need to be some follow up here on, right. on chain of command, on communication. Will there be a new protocol that comes from this? Well, they do say they are doing a 30 day review of what happened and you know, why uh, Why he didn't tell people. He is known to be a very private man, yeah. and he may have thought that this is nobody's business. The trouble is, as I think Anne-Marie said this morning, when you become a public official, you leave your private life at the door. Sure. And um, he, like I said, because of the situation, they will have to review it. The White House has also taken pains to say that Nothing bad did happen while he was out of commission, mm -hmm. and that Deputy Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks, who is widely respected, had her hand on the tiller and that everything was okay. We still don't know, though, how much she knew about why she was taking over. Yes, right. Did he call her and say, sorry, I'm going to be out for a couple of days, can you run the place? Or did he give her the whole story so she knew the depth of this? That's yeah. what we still don't know. Seemed to think that he could get this all taken care of over Christmas and nobody would know. Uh, any better. Right. Uh, Wendy, thank you so much for the insights. Wendy Benjaminson with us at the table as we turn now to Bloomberg's Dan Flatley. Dan, it's great to be with you as we see the Secretary of State back in Tel Aviv today. Anthony Blinken speaking earlier today in Jerusalem as well in this case. Let's listen. It's clearly not in the interest of anyone, Israel, Lebanon, Hezbollah for that matter, uh, to see this uh, to see this escalate and to see an actual conflict. And we've had 40 countries come together to make clear that what the Houthis are doing has to stop. And we have other countries that have made clear that if it continues, uh, there have to be consequences. So our strong view, our strong preference is that the Houthis get the message that they're receiving from countries around the world that this needs to stop. And that's what we're focused on. Secretary had a number of messages today, Dan, urging restraint to lower civilian casualties, also talking about what a post-war Israel and Palestine might look like. What's the real priority on this trip? Well, I think certainly what uh, Secretary Blinken wants to communicate to uh, the U.S.'s allies in the region, particularly Israel, but, but others, is that they do not want this war to broaden out into a regional conflict. So you have all the elements that you would need for something like that to happen, as we've seen with some of these attacks by the Houthis on shipping in the Red Sea, some attacks on U.S. troops in Syria and Iraq. 
and uh, sub strikes in Lebanon and, and other places outside of Gaza. So you certainly don't want to see this conflict broaden out, particularly in an election year, although political considerations are somewhat secondary, uh, secondary to the kind of defense uh, posture here. But I think primarily what the secretary was trying to get across today was a message to Israel that what is happening in Gaza needs to uh, sort of wind down at some point. Uh, and he got a lot of pushback from Israeli officials saying that they intend to fully carry out their mission, their operations, in order to eliminate Hamas and make sure that uh, a, an attack like what happened on October 7th can never happen again. So there's a, you know, a little bit of tension there, but I think that his message was, was heard in the region for sure. All right, Bloomberg's Dan Flatley, great reporting. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time. And coming up, we'll turn to another story. President Trump making his case for immunity from federal criminal prosecution in front of a D.C. appellate court. We'll have more on that with Jessica Roth coming up. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. President, as we said, it's the opening of a Pandora's box, and that's a very, that's a very sad thing that's happened with this whole situation. I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. Very simple. That's former President Trump after the appellate court hearing in Washington today in the criminal case brought against him by special counsel Jack Smith. He, of course, claims immunity from prosecution, and the defense argued their case before the tribunal overseeing the appeal. Here's a taste of how it went. I asked you a yes, no, yes or no question. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is, is, no. is My answer is qualified, yes. There is a political process that would have to occur under us to structure our Constitution, which would require impeachment and conviction by the Senate. Let's bring in former federal prosecutor and law professor at Cordoza Law School, Jessica Roth. So, Jessica, is the answer a qualified yes? So the clip that you just played, I thought, was the most remarkable part of this entire argument today. And it's because of the former president's lawyer's response to the question, that very question, the hypothetical of a president who orders uh, SEAL Team 6 to take out a political rival. Could he be prosecuted after he left office for that crime if he had not been previously impeached and convicted? The answer was really no. That was what his lawyer said. And that answer, I think, did not sit well with the judges. And for that reason, I think they are unlikely to rule in Trump's favor. Uh, so th the question that remains is how will the court rule against Trump? Because it did seem that they all three were inclined to rule against him. But there was not a clear message coming from the panel today about how exactly they would do that and on what basis. Well, I guess that's our question about how this moves forward. These three judges, Professor, two Biden appointees and a George H.W. Bush appointee who replaced Ken Starr many years ago on this panel, were very skeptical of what they heard today. Uh, where would it go next? We, we've obviously talked a lot about the Supreme Court, but there is a higher appellate court this could reach, right? Well, this was the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. It was a three-judge panel. After they issue mm -hmm. their opinion, Trump could seek rehearing in bank. So he could ask the entire D.C. Court of Appeals to reconsider their decision. Um, so the question would be, would he do that if they rule against him? Would he seek first to go to the, the United, States Court of, uh, United States Supreme Court, which he could do instead of first seeking in-bank review? I think it's going to depend mm -hmm. in part on how they rule. I mean, the first thing that I was interested in for today's argument was how interested are the judges going to be in this question of whether they have jurisdiction to hear this issue on appeal now before there's been a trial. There had been an amicus brief filed suggesting that the court did not have jurisdiction to hear what's called an interlocutory appeal 
on the question of immunity. Neither of the parties had briefed that issue. They just assumed that the court had jurisdiction. And so the first thing that was very interesting this morning was the court asked right off the bat about that question. Neither party embraced the position that had been raised by the amicus, that there was no jurisdiction. And the court, although it was quite interested, and I think, in concern that it had jurisdiction, seemed inclined to go ahead and reach the merits of the case perhaps under a doctrine known as hypothetical jurisdiction that for which there is precedent um, mm. in the decisions. And so that's the first question that the court will have to rule on, I think, is whether or not they have jurisdiction and how they rule on that also could affect the trajectory. In other words, if they find they have no jurisdiction and they go no further and they don't consider the merits, they would be sending it immediately back to the trial court. Trump could again seek in bank review that mm. he could um, go to the U.S. Supreme Court, but that's sort of the first threshold issue that we'll be interested to see how they rule on. Okay, so Professor, as this process plays out, however it does, what is the requirement of President, former President Trump as a defendant? Because he has said in fundraising emails in the last 24 hours that he was being forced into the courtroom, distracted from campaigning. Is there any requirement that he be in attendance? Was he, did he have to be there today? Does he have to be at any others in the future? He does not have to attend any appellate argument. Um, and so it's disingenuous for him to say that Biden or anybody else uh, from the government or from the special counsel's office was requiring him to be present in court today. Um, he could have absolutely let his lawyers handle this entirely without his presence. There was no way for him to participate in today's proceeding. This was not a evidence-taking uh, procedure. This was an entirely an appellate lawyer's argument presenting to the court. So he can certainly choose to be present, but he was not required to be present. And that's going to be true at any appellate argument. And we may well see a good deal of those as this and other sort of purely legal questions, questions work their way through the courts. Just to be clear, that would also include uh, closing arguments on Thursday at his uh, civil trial in New York. Uh, correct, Professor? He doesn't have to be there, but will be. So we'll all end up yes. talking about him. I have to ask you quickly about what's happening in Georgia. Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis being accused of inappropriately employing a romantic partner as a special prosecutor against Donald Trump and then going on vacation with this partner using money that he apparently made uh, from the DA who authorizes his compensation. If these accusations are true as brought forth in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, what happens to this case? Well, I'd like to read those filings. I have not yet had the opportunity to read the filings nor to see any supporting evidence. I don't think there has been any supporting evidence filed yet, and I'd like to read any response um, that the district attorney files. Um, my biggest concern, based on the allegations thus far, would be the misuse of funds uh, or the use of state funds for personal use, uh, perhaps indirectly, um, through this other prosecutor who's been hired. Um, that is the issue that would raise the greatest concern to me. But again, um, I want to wait and see more here in terms of the supporting evidence, yeah. uh, the arguments, uh, and the legal authority cited going forward. Well, your tempered response is why we always want to have you back. Jessica Roth, we thank you, as always, for the insights today on Bloomberg. Coming up, two versions of populism going head-to-head -head in the 2024 presidential election. We'll have more on that next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. As campaign season heats up, two versions of populism are at the center of the debate over the next president of the United States. It's one takeaway from The Rebels, a new book by Bloomberg's own Josh Green, in which he writes, quote, Biden's populist turn is an unexpected coda to a long career that first established him as a business-friendly Democrat. By the time he became president, though, the financial crisis of 2008, the grindingly slow recovery and backlash that delivered Trump to the White House led Biden to alter his approach. Josh joins us now, and congrats on the release, Josh a great piece of work here. The problem for Joe Biden is that it has not been connecting with voters in the polls. The self-proclaimed friendliest uh, administration to organize labor doesn't seem to be actually turning into the approval numbers he needs 
uh, to get momentum on the campaign yeah. trail? How come? Uh, well, I think that's partly because the, the changes that, that Biden's program has put in place, even though we can kind of see them in all sorts of economic numbers and consumer sentiment numbers, haven't really filtered through yet. Uh, and I think the, the challenge and the worry for Biden and his campaign uh, is that that needs to happen before November. I mean, look, the, the, the presidential race uh, formally kicks off on Monday in Iowa. And if, mm -hmm. as most people expect, uh, the general election winds up being a rematch of Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, then what we're really looking at, as I write, as I write in the book and in, in Business Week this week, is uh, a rematch of a kind of Trump's right-leaning populism versus Biden's left-leaning populism. Uh, I think at this point, the best you can say is that the economy, and we see this in numbers every day, uh, really has recovered remarkably from the COVID crash of a couple of years ago with inflation coming down now, uh, rate cuts expected. Uh, but the big problem for Biden is that voters just don't seem to be crediting him for that positive turn. And if he wants yeah. to win a second term, he's going to have to convince them. Well, one of my favorite lines in the excerpt that can be read in Bloomberg Business Week or on the terminal right now, for that matter, you write, it's possible Biden's industrial policy with its focus on American workers will one day be seen as his most consequential legacy, but probably only if he wins. And to win, of course, theoretically, he would need to get through Donald Trump. But I wonder if it's telling that actually some of the rebels you're writing about in this book, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, also tried to run for president. Biden beat them to be the Democratic nominee. Would that suggest that the kind of left-leaning populism doesn't actually work? Yeah, I, you know, th this is really sort of the history I tell in the book. First, the rise of this populist splinter group of Democrats that really didn't emerge until after the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, all of that, uh, as we remember, culminated in the 2020 Democratic primaries. I think part of the problem for the left populists uh, was that there were two of them. There was Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, and they split the vote. Uh, but the conclusion of my book, and I think the smart takeaway about the influence of this kind of politics on the Democratic Party, uh, is that Joe Biden, is, as, as you guys had in that original quote from the book, uh, has really taken up a lot of this agenda, especially the economic populist agenda. And he has really kind of morphed from being, you know, when I came to Washington in 2000, he was known as the senator from corporate America because he represented Delaware. Mm -hmm. Today, he's instituted a lot of these populist policies, and certainly uh, a lot of economists and people in his White House think uh, that that is where the credit lies for the turnaround mm -hmm. that we've had in the American economy over the last couple of years. Biden's going to have to go out, though, and make that case. I've been traveling around the country, uh, both for the book and for the Business Week piece, to places where they're you know, building new manufacturing facilities, building new steel plants. People are excited. Unemployment is coming down. There is job growth, but they're not crediting Joe Biden. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> That's right. All right. Bloomberg's Joshua Green. Great piece. Looking forward to reading the full book. Really appreciate your time. But coming up, we'll turn from domestic politics to geopolitics. Discuss Ukraine with Angela Stent of the Brookings Institution. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg. Russia's doing better on missiles, on manpower. Russia's on the offensive in the net school bust. The, I think Ukraine's got to turn around this year. They've got to stop the infighting in the government. They've got to scale up weapons production. Or I think next year we could talk about Ukraine beginning to lose. Lose meaning having to accept an unfavorable armistice where they give up more land. From our conversation with the Eurasia Group's Cliff Kupchin yesterday, one of those conversations you think about for a while after. Today, Bloomberg reported that a secret meeting took place last month between Ukraine, its G7 allies, and a small group of global South countries to try to rally support for conditions for holding actual peace talks with Russia. Joining us now to talk about it, Angela Stent, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and, of course, author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the rest. Angela, it's great to see you. Russia was not invited to this meeting. What does it think about it? So this was a meeting to discuss. It's the fourth uh, meeting in a series to discuss a 10-point peace plan that President Zelensky came up with some time ago. Uh, and the Russians have completely rejected this peace plan. Uh, one of the provisions in the peace plan would be for Ukraine to have its territorial integrity restored, i.e. for Russian troops to withdraw 
uh, to where they not only where they were uh, before February 24th, but before they took over the Donbass in 2014. Now, uh, mm. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, gave an interview at the end of last year where he completely rejected that. He said Ukraine doesn't have any right to territorial integrity anymore because it violated promises it made when it became an independent country uh, in 1992, i.e. Uh, when it said it wanted to be neutral and respect the rights of Russian speakers. So uh, the, the Russians won't even discuss this plan. And of course, they haven't been invited to any of these meetings. Okay, so whether it's this plan or another that Russia may actually be able to get on board with, is this now what it is time for, some kind of negotiated settlement? Or is there still a chance that Ukraine can win this war outright? So I don't think it's time for a negotiated settlement because the only thing that the Russians would agree to now, and you heard from uh, Clifford Kupchin that, you know, they're doing somewhat better than they were before. The only thing they would agree to would be for Ukraine to accept the loss of these four territories that Russia has annexed, although it doesn't control all of them. Um, any Ukrainian government that would do that would be out of office anyway, but it's unacceptable because it leaves Ukraine extremely vulnerable. Uh, so neither the Ukraine Ukrainians nor the Russians are interested in real peace talks now. But I think what the Russians are interested in is to begin a process of negotiation that wouldn't lead anywhere, but they would where they would be seen to be making an effort uh, in the lead run up to Putin's re-election in March. Of course, we've got a debate uh, on funding here in the U.S. Angela, we've talked about it repeatedly. It hinges on a deal over the border. And there's a chance that this just won't happen. I talked yesterday uh, with Howard Buffett, whose philanthropic effort has brought about a half billion dollars to Ukraine. He told us that the country is fighting more uh, U.S. adversaries than just Russia in this war. Here's what he said. Ukraine is fighting not just the second uh, most powerful military in the world, but they're also fighting really by proxy Iran and North Korea. So, so Ukraine is fighting three of our largest enemies at this point in time. If we withdraw from Ukraine, we have no allies and no friends in the world when we come to having to fight or deal with another conflict. Angela, that's a very real possibility based on what we're hearing uh, from some in Washington who don't want to see continued support. Do you agree with Buffett's take? Yeah, I mean, if the support doesn't come through for Ukraine, U.S. support, and then if the European 50 billion euros also doesn't come through because of hung Hungary blocking it, then Ukraine's ability to keep fighting the Russians will diminish this year. They can't ramp up their own production of weapons that quickly. And if they are defeated by the Russians, um, you know, the Russia will be emboldened to go further. Uh, maybe to attack another country, not now, but in the near future. And the message that it will send to all of our allies around the world, if we don't uh, continue to support Ukraine, is that they shouldn't trust us, that we're no good as an ally. Plus, it's the precedent of one country invading another country, completely unprovoked, and taking territory. And that has implications for many countries in the world, uh, which have disputed territories. Well, Angela, that was basically the case that Mr. Buffett was making, this idea that if, if the U.S. backs away now, then it's going to be on NATO's doorstep before we know it. Do you really think Vladimir Putin would make a move on a NATO country, knowing that alliance has gotten even more fortified and even larger since this conflict began almost two years ago? Well, so far, we know that during this war, the Russians have been pretty uh, careful not to do anything that would make NATO enter this war, although they have um, it violated Polish airspace and uh, Romanian airspace to NATO allies. It's not likely that they would do that now. Uh, they certainly might use a victory over Ukraine uh, to attack some other post-Soviet states. Uh, Moldova, I think, would come to mind as maybe the first one. Um, but certainly, if you talk to people in the Baltic states, given their experience with Russian and Soviet occupation, uh, they believe that the Russians still have their sights on these three states, which were part of the Soviet Union. So it's not very likely, uh, but you can't rule this out, again, if Russia thinks that it's been victorious and that the West isn't going to stop it. Angela, getting back to where we started, this secret meeting uh, with Ukraine, G7, some global South countries, why does it need to be secret? Well, so the first three meetings in these series were public uh, in Copenhagen and Jeddah and in Malta. Uh, but maybe yeah. it's given, you know, the intensity of the war and they're really trying to figure out 
say, with a country like Saudi Arabia, which, of course, has just joined the BRICS uh, and steers very carefully between Russia and, and other countries in the U.S., maybe they're trying to get the buy-in from some of these global South countries uh, to move forward. But since we don't know what was discussed there, you know, it's just speculation. Mm -hmm. Finally, Angela, I'd like to ask you a different question, leaning on the, the time you have spent in the U.S. government. Of course, you worked in the State Department. Uh, you've been involved in other ways as well. The United States Defense Secretary right now is hospitalized. They say that he is doing his work. He has access to the information, uh, security uh, communications that he needs. But there was a massive question around communication between defense and the White House and the American public because his condition was not known for some time. We just learned today that it's prostate cancer that he's dealing with. What is your reaction to these revelations? I think probably there was a, a misunderstanding of the chain of command here. And obviously, the president needed to know about that. Uh, you know, the, there are two major wars going on, Russia, Ukraine and Israel, Gaza. Uh, and of course, uh, Secretary Austin does have a deputy and she was told that she was in charge there. But uh, probably there was some failure of communication here. And I'm sure that all the relevant people are examining this and figuring out uh, how not to let this happen again. All right. Well, we will leave it on that note. Angela Stent of the Brookings Institution, thank you so much, as always, for joining us this evening. And coming up, we'll have much more on the secrecy surrounding Secretary Austin and his hospital stay. Our political panel will have reaction next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. The department recognizes the understandable concerns expressed by the public, Congress, and the news media in terms of notification timelines and DOD transparency. And I want to underscore again that Secretary Austin has taken responsibility for the issues with transparency, and the department is taking immediate steps to improve our notification procedures. That was Department of Defense Press Secretary General Patrick Ryder addressing the confusion surrounding Secretary Lloyd Austin's hospital stay. Let's go to our political panel, Lauren Tomlinson, partner at Steer PR, and Kevin Walling, Democratic strategist at HG Creative Media. So, Lauren, just to recap what we learned today, the defense secretary is fighting prostate cancer. That is what he is hospitalized for. And not only did we just learn this today, the White House mm -hmm. just learned this today. And I look at the statement that we got from Walter Reed they say prostate cancer discussions are often deeply personal and private ones, and maybe that factors in here. But how much privacy is the Secretary of Defense, someone in the line of succession for the presidency, entitled to in a case like this? Unfortunately, not a lot. And I think that this is something that Lloyd Austin is realizing um, throughout this week is that when you assume these responsibilities um, and most importantly, not even just within the line of succession, but as a trust exercise, when you're running, uh, when you're working with this many military officials and you're leading, you know, our men and women in uniform, it's really important that they can have uh, trust in the system and transparency in the system. And while cancer treatment is very, very deeply personal and you you know, my greatest thoughts and prayers go out to, you know, Secretary Austin as he's dealing with this. Unfortunately, when you're a leader like this, you have to disclose this type of stuff because it does impact your ability to lead um, our men and women in uniform. And I think that's really um, at the crux of this is that he needed to disclose early. He needed to, and oversight. He really needed, you know, Congress didn't know about this. The oversight committees didn't know about this. And that's a big violation of trust because in the very least they should have known what was going on. The White House should have known what was going on. They needed to have um, all of the transfers of powers, which I think some sort of had. There was a little bit of that that happened to the deputy secretary, um, but there really should have been more fulsome planning for this. Get ready for the hearings. Uh, Kevin, you know, Joe Biden, he's not going to fire the secretary of defense. Does he need to show a little anger here, though? Well, listen, I think we saw the readout from that call that the president had with Secretary Austin, where it was very uh, uh, conciliatory in terms of uh, caring about his yes. condition. I think that's in, in, the, in the forefront what should happen from this president. I think we'll get uh, more information as the process plays out. There clearly needs to be uh, some investigation that is now ongoing. If you're the, the commander in chief, so you're learning the same day that Joe and Kaylee are, we have a problem. It's hugely problematic. Yeah. It's hugely problematic. You have a, a secretary of defense who is... Uh, known for being kind of private uh, for secrecy. 
Uh, but to Lauren's point, it's not just the uh, uh, issue of succession, your point, Joe, it's also the chain of command, mm -hmm. right? And you had the Deputy uh, Secretary Hicks on vacation during that time. Now, she was in Puerto Rico, right? So she has facilities there that she can conduct that business, but should not have left town uh, knowing that uh, and clearly was not informed. Wow. Well, there's also just the optic question here. Aside from the actual operations uh, of, of the military and of the chain of, in command, the idea that the president of the United States was not only not aware for days that his defense secretary was in the hospital, but that the defense secretary, upon telling him he was in the hospital, didn't disclose that he was fighting cancer, that it took days for them, for the White House at least, to realize that Secretary Austin was not reachable, especially at a time when the U.S. is enmeshed in so many conflicts around the world, Lauren, can the Defense Department and the White House be seen this far apart? No, and I think you're, you're keying in on a really important word there, that this is an optics problem, because in all practical purposes, the government would have continued to function, mm -hmm. right? We have so many checks and balances in place, and the democracy works so well after, you know, all of our planning and contingency planning and all of these things, um, that while it's alarming, we would have been fine. That being said, the optics of this, especially for a president that's running on um, an election promise of a strong, transparent democracy, that he's going to have stability where there may be chaos and with other candidates. I think that politically is a big problem here, especially at this time, because there is so much going on in the world. And there is a really big, important um, role that the United States plays in projecting this strength of democracy, the way our system works, the way that the transparency and the checks and balances work really well to represent the people and protect their interests. And so I think that's the bigger problem there is the loss of trust and the optics there, the political optics. Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is something the secretary could uh, recover from and serve for many more years. Joe Biden's the kind of guy who dances with the one who brung you. Uh, does he keep the secretary on if he wins re-election? I think he keeps the secretary on as long as the secretary is interested in serving. This is a guy who led troops in, uh, in, in battle as a four-star uh, a general, including Bo Biden, his son, where yeah. he uh, then came on the senator's radar, then Senator Biden's radar. So the president, to your point, Joe, is an extremely loyal guy, <laughs> uh, very much uh, different from the pre his predecessor uh, in that regard. So I, I suspect that the secretary will have the president's full faith and trust, and the yeah. process will play out. There will be investigation. There should be some hearing. There should be oversight, to Lawrence point, with the Armed Services Committee. You saw joint statements by both the Republican right. uh, and Democratic leadership of that committee in the House and the Senate jointly uh, because of the national security implications of that, uh, and, and we'll let the process play out. We've got a lot more to learn on this. Coming up, our political panel sticking with us to break down the polling numbers ahead of next week's Iowa caucus, new numbers on New Hampshire two weeks from today as well. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I say he was the right president at the right time. He was good at breaking things, right? But now we need somebody to fix them. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley last night on Fox's town hall, as they call it, as she may be gaining ground here in New Hampshire. But it depends on what poll you look at. We got a couple today and our political panel is back with us to help decipher the numbers. Lauren Tomlinson, partner at Steer PR, is with us along with Kevin Walling, Democratic strategist at HG Creative Media. All right, let's get into the numbers here because it's uh, taster's choice, I guess, Lauren. <laughs> Suffolk University, Boston Globe, USA Today. And Suffolk is a pretty good operation up in New England. This is specifically New Hampshire. Nikki Haley is 20 points below Donald Trump. Not great with two weeks to go. 46 to 26. New CNN, University of New Hampshire poll, though, shows her chipping away at the lead. Take a look at this if you're watching to single digits, suggesting that she could actually pull off a win, depending on how momentum comes together. Which one rings true? Well, I don't think any polls matter until you get to the ballot box, <laughs> okay. right? Yeah. This Democrat <laughs> agrees. This Democrat <laughs> agrees with that one. Nothing matters until the, until the votes are cast. Um, but you know what? The Haley campaign is celebrating that CNN poll because For it's sure. showing exactly what her campaign has been based upon, which is slowly chipping away at Donald Trump's support, showing that there's other options, and showing consistent momentum going into these uh, nominating contests. And so I think that's actually my biggest takeaway from this. It's mm. not the numbers, like whatever. It's 
it's the fact that um, she's going into these primaries now. She's going to Ohio, New Hampshire with the wind at her back. And so, you know, if Donald Trump doesn't break 50 percent and he doesn't have a decisive lead in these two, then I think that that means that she can continue on and we have a real contest here. And that's what she's going to be looking for. It's so interesting that we're talking about the idea that Trump could win Iowa and still almost lose if his margin is not uh, <laughs> wide enough for himself. Yeah. Even on the subject of Nikki Haley, though, she, of course, had that town hall last night ahead of another time. We will see her tomorrow when she uh, debates Ron DeSantis on CNN. <laughs> she got a little stuck on the question of the retirement age, thanks very much to an interview done by our very own Joe Matthew and Anne-Marie Horder and on Bloomberg. And moderator Brett Baer pushed her on that. Just take a <laughs> listen to this exchange. We go to people like my kids in their 20s when they're coming into the system and we say the rules have changed. We change retirement age to reflect life expectancy. Instead of cost of living increases, we do it based on inflation. We limit the benefits the on the wealthy and we expand Medicare Advantage plans. What's the right age there then, Ambassador? Well, I think we have to do the numbers. We've got to figure out what it is. But what we do know is 65 is way too low, and we need to increase that. We need to do it according to life expectancy. So that was the exchange between Joe and Nikki Haley. In her exchange with Beth, Brett Baer, she essentially said she had never said the retirement age was, was way read that too back low. To <laughs> How problematic of an issue is this, this idea of touching entitlements, which no one ever wants to do in a race like this one? Yeah, it's a good question. Nobody wants to do it. I actually think I was on the Balance of Power show that you day because I remember uh, that very conversation. This and, you know, she actually said on the stump uh, not too long ago, I think it was yesterday or the day before, that now all the focus is on her. So to your point, uh, uh, these questions are going to come up in terms of previous statements, things that she did at the U.N., things that she did in South Carolina. And that's just the nature of the game with this kind of uh, more scrutiny. Uh, and she welcomes that scrutiny because she thinks it's indicative of her place in this race. It's pretty remarkable. Uh that no one will touch this. There were a lot of references to black boxes uh, a little bit earlier uh, in the program. We won't bring Al Gore into this conversation, but Democrats and Republicans have this in common. No one's going to go there in this campaign. And if you're Nikki Haley, you're not going to answer a question like that a week before voting begins, are you? No, and I think that's going to be um, her biggest challenge right now is every now that the focus is on her yeah. um, entitlements, for example, is one of, a, you know, the favorites uh, to stick people on because, like you said, it's so polarizing. People don't want to talk about it as needed as it is uh, to fix our debt and deficit. And so when you start to bring in uh, touching people's entitlements, touching people's benefits, everyone freaks out. So for <laughs> her, it is going to be a matter of staying on the message. Pivot, pivot, pivot and get through. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I imagine that's why she didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't remember yeah, why she you to asked this question. Yeah, selective memory loss. Yeah, selective memory loss. Yeah, selective memory loss. It, it's definitely a political um, downfall, and you don't want to add to those potential yeah. campaign ads, right? That you know would probably come very quickly in the general. Mm -hmm. Well, and that Trump is already rolling out against her in places like New Hampshire when yes. he's taking a look at the numbers and seeing that she's getting closer. On the subject of the former president, though, we of course saw him today here in Washington. He appeared at an appellate hearing that he did not legally need to attend, but made the case that he was in the courtroom instead of on the campaign trail. As the primary season goes on, these court dates, are they more advantageous to him because he can go make his case that he's being you know, victimized by the Department of Justice than they detract from the idea that he's not campaigning? I think you're absolutely right. Plus, you know, you look at the temperature right now in Iowa, even though it's a miserable day here in Washington, I'd much rather be here than in <laughs> Iowa. Uh, but listen, every time he's in the news with another indictment, with another court uh, date hearing, his poll numbers go up in the Republican field and he raises much more money, uh, which is also going to be critical to fund a lot of these legal challenges that he's facing in yeah. terms of campaign funds uh, for those efforts. So clearly it's a calculation based on the campaign. He released that short statement, it looked almost like a hostage video, that one minute or two minute speech that he gave today, attacking everyone uh, that he could. Uh, but certainly it plays well for the Republican right. He predicted Bedlam when he talked to reporters, uh, should this case move forward. There's been a lot of worry about domestic violence, about political violence breaking out in this campaign cycle. Is that a worry that you share? Yeah, I think it's always a worry, especially how heightened um, our politics have gotten over the past few years. And if you uh, talk to voters, they're very 
anxious mm -hmm. right now um, on all sides. Um, so I think that's very real. And, um, you know, I don't know that, you know, anything that Donald Trump does or does not do is going to be more impactful. I think mm -hmm. that we can definitely expect, regardless of who wins, there's going to be a challenge in 2024 to the election results. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of things like that that we can expect. And, you know, yeah. what's going to make this really interesting is I think we're going to have a lot of tests to our constitutional system that uh, legal questions that are going to be answered over the next several months that I think yeah. Really Some defining. of those by the Supreme Court. Lauren Tomlinson That's and right. Kevin Walling, thank you both so much for joining us. And you can get more coverage like this in our Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining. We'll be back here tomorrow on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg.